Welcome to the eighth lecture and module of this course on technology in the psyche. Uh, this lecture is entitled Mechanical Reproduction and Gnostic Technology, and we'll be looking at the work of two essayists who were and are close observers of the influence of technology on art and on the psyche, Walter Benjamin and Eric Davis. This is Walter Benjamin, who lived uh, from 1892 to 1940, one of the most brilliant intellectuals of Weimar Germany, who always uh, lived a bit from hand to mouth. He never had an academic uh, tenure position. He was known um, as a particularly uh, brilliant thinker by uh, a relatively small group of uh, people in the know. And it's really uh, in more recent years that his influence has grown and grown. There was a massive biography uh, in English that came out about him a couple of years ago. He uh, committed suicide in 1940 because uh, he was unable to get a transit visa uh, through Spain to Portugal, which was neutral. Obviously, he was fleeing the Nazis, and it's considered somehow symbolic of his life that uh, actually, uh, if he had waited a day, uh, that document uh, would have come through. His work on the French poet Baudelaire is uh, particularly revelatory. He uh, was an early appreciator of Kafka. Uh, he had an extremely a wide range of interests. His work is uh, particularly hard to pigeonhole or categorize. He came under the influence of Bertolt Brecht and became a Marxist, as uh, we'll see in uh, the work we're going to be reading. However, uh, one of his best friends was uh, also Gershom Sholem, the great uh, student of Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism who was also close to Kafka. Benjamin began to become better known uh, in 1955 when a German edition of his works uh, called Schriften, or Writings, came out. His uh, work began to appear in English first in 1969 uh, with a compilation of his essays uh, compiled uh, by this woman, Hannah Arndt. The compilation uh, is called Illuminations, and uh, Hannah Arndt is uh, probably most famous for her uh, book on Eichmann's trial, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, she was a refugee from Nazi Germany uh, who uh, was married actually to uh, Benjamin's first cousin, and she also contributed a wonderful introduction uh, to this collection, which has somewhat the same relationship to Benjamin's work uh, in America and the UK that um, Labyrinths has to Borges's work. The essay we'll be reading, uh, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, first appeared in English in uh, the collection Illuminations. And it's certainly one of his, uh, if not his most famous and influential work. What does happen uh, to the work of art uh, under the influence of mechanical reproduction or technology? Benjamin starts uh, the essay with uh, a wonderful quote from the French essayist and poet Paul Valéry, who says, the amazing growth of our techniques, the adaptability and precision they have attained, the ideas and habits they are creating, make it a certainty that profound changes are impending in the ancient craft of the beautiful. Uh, Benjamin takes the position that uh, something is uh, lost and something else is gained when it becomes possible to make or reproduce art uh, in mass quantities. Mechanical reproduction, of course, makes uh, works of art more readily available to uh, the man on the street, the common man or woman. And this, uh, says Benjamin, 
the somewhat half-hearted Marxist uh, is, is a very good thing in uh, many respects. What is lost, uh, Benjamin says in what's probably the most uh, famous passage from the essay uh, in the work of art that's uh, been mechanically reproduced is its aura. This is its uh, uniqueness, its authority, uh, its authenticity. Given the importance of this passage, uh, Benjamin is often read as being uh, a critic of uh, the role of technology in art. And actually, one of the reasons that Benjamin is such a half-hearted Marxist is that there is uh, most definitely a nostalgia for uh, the singular work of art, for that which is unique and irreplaceable. I think that there's a large overlap uh, between Benjamin's uh, use of the term aura and what we've been calling uh, the psyche in this class. Is technology taking away the psyche or soul uh, from the work of art? And uh, in certain respects, the answer is yes. And in other respects, it's no in the sense that uh, it is, uh, that is technology is reshaping both art and the way in which we uh, perceive our environment like uh, Hermes the trickster. Technology is a shape shifter that is causing us to shift our shapes. The arts of photography and uh, cinema or the film movies are uh, particularly important uh, examples of uh, what Benjamin calls art in the age of mechanical reproduction. He says that while um, photography was originally used for portraits around the turn of the 20th century uh, with photographers such as Eugène Adjay, uh, who took uh, photographs of the deserted streets of Paris. Photographs are uh, not now trying to recapture something like the soul of a lost, a lost loved one, but present something. Uh, Benjamin says, the 19th century dispute as to the artistic value of painting versus photography today seems devious and confused. This does not diminish its importance, however. If anything, it underlines it. Earlier, much futile thought had been devoted to the question of whether photography is an art. The primary question, whether the very invention of photography had not tr transformed the entire nature of art, was not asked. Soon, film theoreticians asked the same ill-considered question with regard to the film. The contrast here uh, with film is between film and the theater. Benjamin says the camera that presents the performance of the film actor to the public need not respect the performance as an integral whole. The audience's identification with the actor is really an identification with the camera. With techniques uh, such as editing or montage, uh, the performer uh, loses his or her aura. This is, of course, a series of uh, stills from one of the most famous montage uh, sequences in film history, the shower scene in uh, Hitchcock's Psycho. Such film techniques as montage, uh, Benjamin says, strikingly show that art has left the realm of the beautiful semblance, which so far had been taken to be the only sphere where art could thrive. The implication being that the sphere of what constitutes art has changed through the introduction of technology and mechanical reproduction. Benjamin speaks about the ancient lament that the masses seek distraction, whereas art demands concentration from the spectator. Benjamin says that a man who concentrates before a work of art is absorbed by it. In contrast, the distracted mass absorbs the work of art. It's um, an entirely different relationship, but Benjamin implies none less valid uh, for that and very interestingly compares the experience uh, of watching a film 
with uh, people's experience of architecture, which is, of course, a very ancient art. This is the uh, this is a photo of the recently built Seattle Public Library uh, done by architect Rem Koolhaas. It's the sort of work of architecture that uh, surrounds you, as a film might surround you, but as a great uh, work of architecture, the experience of being absorbed into it as one is absorbed into a riveting film is uh, particularly exhilarating. We will also be reading uh, the work of this gentleman, Eric Davis, who was born in 1967, uh, three chapters from his first book, Tech Gnosis, Myth, Magic, and Mysticism in the Age of Information. This uh, book originally came out in 1998 uh, during uh, what I recall with a bit of nostalgia as being a time when web technology uh, held so much promise it uh, appeared like a magic carpet uh, sweeping us away into wherever we wanted to be swept away into. The edition you have was revised in 2004. Eric is actually doing uh, another edition uh, now, but I've been told that it's a relatively minor one. The chapters we'll be reading uh, recapitulate many of our themes. It reflects some of the techno-optimism of the time that it was written, while at the same time casting a critical uh, eye on uh, some of the claims of uh, the technologists. Uh, he's interested in what Jungians would call uh, the archetypal dimensions of technology, uh, particularly uh, web technology. And uh, like McLuhan, in the ways that uh, the technologies, especially communication technologies, shape the so-called self. Interestingly, uh, early on, um, Eric Davis quotes the late great Jungian uh, James Hillman uh, with regard to uh, the distinction between soul or psyche and spirit. Uh, riffing off of Hillman, uh, Eric says, soul finds and loses itself in enchantment. It speaks uh, the tongue of dream and phantasm, which should never be confused with mere fantasy. Spirit is an altogether different bird, an impersonal incorporeal spark that seeks clarity, essence, and a blast of the absolute. Spirit and soul twine their way throughout this book like the two strands of DNA, both enchanting and spiritualizing media technologies. On the one hand, we'll see that technologies can serve as the vehicles for spells, ghosts, and animist intuitions. On the other, they can provide launching pads for transcendence for the disembodied flights of gnosis. Later on, he says, one thing seems clear. We cannot afford to think in the Manichaean terms that often characterize the debate on new technologies. Technology is neither a devil nor an angel. But neither is it simply a tool, a neutral extension of some rock-solid human nature. Technology is a trickster, and it has been so since the first culture hero taught the human tribe how to spin wool before he pulled it over our eyes. Which uh, brings us back to Hermes, uh, of whom Eric says, certainly Hermes would approve of the internet, a mercurial network of far-flung messages that functions as a marketplace of ideas and commodities. Hermes embodies the mythos of the information age, not just because he is the lord of communication, but because he is also a mastermind of techne, the Greek word that means the art of craft. With hermetic ambiguity in mind, we might say that technology too is a spell and a trick, a device that crafts the real by exploiting the hidden laws of nature and human perception alike. Or uh, you might even say by changing or transforming those laws. Eric also reintroduces us to our old friend uh, Hermes Trismegistus. That combination of uh, Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth, he talks about a famous passage in Plato's dialogue, the Phaedrus, in which Thoth approaches uh, the Egyptian king Thomas 
with an offer of a brand new techne, writing. The king uh, says that he doesn't think that writing is such a good idea since it will cause people to rely less on uh, a sharpness of memory. Be that as it may, um, Eric quotes Walter Ong as saying, more than any other single invention, writing has transformed human consciousness. Much more recently, um, David Abram, in his wonderful book, Spell of the Sensuous, talks about how uh, writing and the alphabet have alienated us from nature. He may have a point, uh, but the other point being, well, is writing really all so bad? As Eric says, like all powerful technologies, thus useful tool transform the user as well. Eric reminds us that uh, the Kabbalah, that form of Jewish uh, mysticism that's uh, undergone recent popularity, is in fact uh, based in the symbology of the Hebrew uh, alphabet. Eric makes the point that reading cannot contain religious experience, but it can certainly catalyze it. He uh, goes into the famous passage from St. Augustine's Confessions, in which Augustine describes his uh, conversion experience, which is illustrated here and which comes about through him uh, hearing some children playing a game uh, in which they keep repa repeating the phrase tole lege, which means take up and read. Augustine, who's been in the middle of a spiritual crisis, uh, takes up and reads uh, the Bible and has uh, a revelatory and um, transformative experience. It's worth mentioning here that while many Buddhist Enlightenment narratives involve uh, fed up Zen monks climbing over the monastery walls in the dead of night only suddenly to realize or to come to realization, there are also uh, a number of narratives uh, where the aspirant comes to a moment of revelation uh, upon reading a, a sutra or a commentary on a sutra. Eric uh, also reminds us that the hermetic or alchemical magus uh, gave rise to both mystical gnosis and uh, modern science. In chapter nine, uh, The Path is a Network, the last chapter of this book that we'll be reading, he brings up uh, the wonderful image of Indra's net, which is pictured here. This is a universal or cosmic net in which uh, the creator or demiurge has placed uh, a single glittering jewel in each eye of the net. And since the net itself is infinite in dimension, the jewels are infinite in number. If you look at any of the jewels, you will discover that uh, in its surface, there are reflected all the other jewels in the net, infinite in number. Not only that, but each of the jewels reflected in this one jewel is also reflecting all the other jewels so that there is an infinite reflecting process occurring. This is a symbol of the Buddhist view of mutual interdependence or paticca samuppada. And as the Buddhist scholar Joanna Macy argues, both cybernetic systems, that is the systems underlying uh, what we think of as computation and Buddhist philosophy can be said to characterize the world as a nonlinear dance of mutually modulating feedback loops. Eric goes on to say uh, that the practice of meditation, which is of course a whole garden shed of practices or techniques that various Asian contemplative traditions honed with an unparalleled sophistication is the ultimate Gnostic technology. There are many uh, postmodern and techno-optimistic comparisons of the web, which used to be called the World Wide Web, to Indra's net, claims that as a web or a net, this most disruptive, quote unquote, of contemporary technologies actually tends toward uh, the non-hierarchical, the distributed. Another image here that uh, Eric mentions is that of the rhizome, 
such uh, plants as grasses, orchids, lilies, and bamboo do not have roots, but rhizomes, creeping underground stems, which spread sideways on dispersed horizontal networks of swollen or slender filaments. So these plants defy categorization as individuated entities, just as Buddhism maintains that um, the notion of self is an illusion uh, which leads to suffering. The image of the rhizome is also particularly important in uh, the book A Thousand Plateaus, which is one of the most uh, influential works of postmodern or post-structuralist philosophy, written by the two uh, French philosophers Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari. The question remains uh, whether this view of the web is uh, wishful thinking, but as usual, it would seem that techno-optimism and techno-pessimism are two sides of the same coin.